1951 was only six years after the Holocaust. And I think that that had really had an impact on his thinking. Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi, of course, of England, once made the point, if the Nazis hunted down every Jew in hate, the Rebbe wanted to search out every Jew in love. And it's remarkable, really, what happened. Chabad, when he became Rebbe, was a relatively small movement centered in one neighborhood in Brooklyn, the Crown Heights area of Brooklyn. And the expansion has been remarkable. Chabad now, when I came out with the book, Chabad was in 49 states. If you know the answer, to this, but they recently appointed a shliach in the 50th state, and I'm very honored, the shliach they appointed was my research assistant for two years on the book, a young man named Mendel Alperovich. If you know the answer to this question, please don't answer it. Uh, it's only directed to people who don't know. What would you guess was the 50th state to get a to get a Chabad shliach? North Dakota. Somebody said Alaska. And no, I had occasion to speak. Wait, 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 folks. One person at a time, because I don't want to be in competition here. Uh, somebody had guessed Alaska. I had occasion to speak to 250 people in Anchorage. Joseph Yosef Greenberg has been there for quite a while. Somebody called out Hawaii. That's my yeah. favorite. Because can you imagine if you were a Chabad Shliach and they showed you 50 states? Do you really think Hawaii would be your last choice? <laughs> Anybody? Somebody else called out Montana. I happen to speak to the Chabad Shliach in Montana, whose goal is to put up a mezuzah in every Jewish household in Montana. When I spoke to him, he had just come from a town in Montana, a city in Montana, that actually sounds like a Jewish shtetl. He had just come from Whitefish. <laughs> okay. Arkansas. Arkansas, they've been there for a while. The answer is South Dakota. South Dakota, which is estimated to have under 400 Jews. It now has a Chabad Shliach, Mendel Alperovich. And by the way, who knows? This, this, I think people might know. Where is the largest Seder held every year in the world? Thailand. In Kathmandu, in Nepal. That basically, it's usually between 1,100 and 1,300 people. A decade after the rabbi's death, Eric Yaffe, who at the time was the president of the URJ, the Union of Reform Judaism, said, it is hard for me to say this, but I will say it nonetheless, we must follow the example of Chabad. So here was a transformative figure, and interestingly, his impact reached well beyond the Jewish world. I'll tell you a story I came across when I was researching the book about Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman ever elected to Congress. She represented an area in Brooklyn called Bedford-Stuyvesant, and it also part of Crown Heights. She comes to Congress in 1968. 1968 was only four years after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, and Congress was still dominated by Southern Democrats, who headed many of the committees. They were not positively inclined towards this black woman, and they put her on the Agriculture Committee prompting one newspaper in Brooklyn to headline the news, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. <laughs> she was not elected from, she didn't want to be on the Agriculture Committee. She wanted to be education, you know, uh, or, or something else, labor committees. And she was very public about how unhappy she was. She gets a phone call from Rabbi Chodakov, who, who was the Rebbe's top aide, who said that the Rebbe wanted to meet with her. She actually was the Rebbe's congresswoman. And the Rebbe had met with her previously. In New York, anybody who was running for public office would meet with the Rebbe. The Rebbe obviously would not endorse any candidates, but he would give people a bracha. And so she came to meet with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said, I understand you're very upset. And she said, I'm upset, I'm angry, I'm insulted. I want to do something in Congress for my people, and they're trying to make me very peripheral. So the Rebbe said to her, what a blessing God has given you. This country has so much surplus food. There are so many hungry people. You must use the gift that God's given you to be on the Agriculture Committee to feed hungry people. Find a creative way to do it. Her first day in Congress, she meets Robert Dole, who had just been elected to the Senate from Kansas, who was worried about uh, farmers and their issues going on in Kansas. They cooperate. In those days, Republicans and Democrats sometimes could actually find <laughs> some common ground. And she does an enormous expansion with him of, uh, for food stamps. And then she helps establish women, infants, and children, WIC, uh, to help the women in, in real need. And the whole story of her encounter with the Rebbe is not known until 15 years later. 
15 years later, when she retires from Congress, uh, a big breakfast is made for her. And for the first time, she tells the story of that encounter with the Rebbe and how it had impacted her. <laughs> and then she said at the end of her speech, a rabbi who is an optimist taught me that what you think is a challenge can be a gift from God. And then she said, if poor babies have milk and poor children have food, it's because that rabbi in Crown Heights had vision. Mm -hmm. So right away, we know we're dealing with a different sort of figure. He was not a provincial figure. This was a man who had a vision for the world. This was a man who was very much driven. People just think associate the Rebbe with a lot of the programs to get Jews to keep more mitzvot. He was very into the whole notion of Sheva mitzvot, the seven laws of the children of Noah, and the impact and the responsibilities that Jews also had to the world. Part of the Rebbe's approach, which became the approach of Chabad, is that every act counts. And that was behind his mitzvah campaigns. I was a high school student in the 60s uh, when John Glenn circled the world. And John Kennedy, who was then president, made that famous pledge that by the end of the 60s, America would have a man on the moon. One of the things that Glenn said, that the Kennedy had occasion to reference when he spoke about Glenn's going and circling the world and the goal to reach the moon, was he said, there's a famous Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. That's what the Rebbe understood. Any mitzvah could be the point that would bring somebody back to a Jewish commitment. But what I understood when I worked on the book was the Rebbe's understanding went well beyond that Chinese proverb. The implication of that Chinese proverb, Lao Tzu, goes, I think, to the 6th century BCE. The implication, but that I might really be wrong on. I hope I'm not wrong on anything in the Rebbe book, but that I might be wrong on. Uh, but the implication of the proverb is every step matters because it's part of that journey of a thousand miles. The Rebbe's attitude was different. Every mitzvah matters in its own right, even if it's not part of the bigger picture. And this had a lot of interesting dimensions. One of the first public campaigns the Rebbe initiated was the Tefillin campaign. If anybody doesn't know what Tefillin are, they're phylacteries. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing you know is that if somebody uses the word phylacteries, they don't put them on. <laughs> so the Rebbe starts the Tefillin campaign, and people are stopped on the streets in New York, and they ask, are you Jewish? And if the person is, answers yes, do they want to put on tefillin? A women, women were asked, are you Jewish? And if the woman answered yes, do you want uh, Shabbos candles? Not surprisingly, a lot of secular Jews were very uncomfortable with this campaign. First of all, a lot of Jews of all brands are uncomfortable with the idea of people stopping them in the street and saying, are you Jewish? <laughs> Secondly, the public putting on a tefillin made many Jews, certainly not such observant Jews, quite uncomfortable. But what was surprising was the Rebbe was also criticized severely in parts of the Orthodox world, even more a little in the right-wing Orthodox world, for an interesting reason, you wouldn't guess. They thought, what is the purpose of getting people to put on tefillin if they're not going to be keeping other mitzvot? Somebody's going to put on tefillin and then go have ham and eggs for breakfast? It has no value. And the Rebbe argued, no, it does have value. We, it, that we can't tie everything in with a bigger program. Things have value in and of themselves. And if somebody understands it has value in and of themselves, they are likely to start keeping other things, but it can't just be a strategy. This was the remarkable thing. It, it operated with the film campaign, it operated with the candle lighting campaign. In New York, for years, there used to be every Friday morning a little classified ad on the front page of the New York Times. And in those days, the Times now sometimes will run ads on the front page. In those days, as far as I know, this was the <coughs> only one they ever ran. And it would say, women and Jewish women and, ch and children, candle lighting today is at 518. <coughs> and, and, and people would know it, and they would put it in there. On January 1st, 2000, the New York Times published its millennial issue. So on that day, they had a regular front page of the New York Times. They also had a reprint of the New York Times for January 1st, 1900. And they also had a projected speculative New York Times for January 1st, 2100. There were all sorts of articles there. Many of them were a little disturbing. You know, should robots be allowed to vote in elections? You know, things and you didn't, in medical terms and things you didn't even understand. 
And then smack in the middle of the page was Jewish women and children, candle lighting today. <laughs> I have a friend who sits next to me in shul, Ari Goldman. Ari Goldman was for 20 years a reporter on the Times. He was the only reporter the Times ever hired with the proviso they didn't have to work on Shabbat or Jewish holidays. And he's now been for years at the Columbia Journalism School. He told me the background. Apparently, that edition of the Times was edited, I think, by an Irish Catholic guy, he told me. And the man happened to notice that January 1st, 2100, is a Friday. So he called up Chabad and said, what time will candle light? I'm presuming the Chabadnik must have answered, if the Mashiach has not arrived by then, candle lighting will be, and he told him the time. That story explains a very interesting and odd phenomenon of Chabad. As a general rule, groups get their primary donations from members of the groups. If you could do a background check, for example, on the biggest givers, let's say, to the Hebrew Union College, the Reform Movement's uh, uh, campus, I'm sure overwhelmingly it's from people who are associated with Reform congregations. It's true in the conservative world, it's true in the orthodox world. Chabad defies it because overwhelmingly, or I don't know overwhelmingly, a large part of their money comes from people who are not in any traditional sense, observant Jews. And I think that story helps explain why, and I'll tell you what I mean. There are a lot of Jews who feel deeply and love their Jewishness, but who are not necessarily confident that their grandsons and granddaughters, or certainly their great-grandsons and great-granddaughters, are going to be in any way involved or active in Jewish life. What they are sure of is that on January 1st, 2100, there are going to be Chabadniks going around telling people what time candle lighting is for Shabbat. So that's why I consider that story you know, to be very basic in understanding what was going on. What were some of the uh, issues uh, or some of the particular passions of the Rebbe that I think made him very significant? One was his continual preaching of the love of humanity, but particularly the love of fellow Jews. So on the one hand, you could say, okay, what's the Kiddush? What's the new insight in that? First of all, love your neighbor as yourself, who I had occasion to speak about it this morning in shul, is probably about the most famous law in the Torah. The true, and you know, you always had, and in the Talmud, you know, you have Akiva speaks on it, it's, it's the major mitzvah. But despite that, we also know there are other texts in the Talmud that lead us to believe that love your neighbor as yourself was not always an observed mitzvah in Jewish life. And there's the very famous teaching in the Talmud that the second temple was destroyed because of sinat chinam, because of causeless hatred. And that really has been a theme in Jewish life. I'll give you an example. There were a lot of tragic events that happened in medieval Jewish history. One of them was the public burning of the Talmud in 1240 in France. How did it come about? In 1232, the Dominicans established an inquisition in France, and the original goal of the inquisition had nothing to do with the Jews. It was to root out heresies within Christianity. Remember, in those days, Martin Luther had not yet lived. Christianity and Catholicism in that part of the world were obviously <coughs> synonymous. But nonetheless, three rabbis brought a heretical Jewish book to them and asked that it be burned. What was the book? It was Maimonides. It was the Sefer Hamada, the opening volume of the Mishnah Torah, and Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed. The Inquisition agreed and burned his books. Eight years later, they burned hundreds of wagon loads of Talmuds. And when I say that, it, it's obviously any time the Talmud's burned, we're going to view it as a tragedy. It was much more tragic in the year 1240 because there was no printing then. Every one of the thousands of volumes of the Talmud that was burned had been handwritten by somebody. And when they burned it, one of those three rabbis so regretted the role he had played that he wanted to go to Maimonides' grave and beg forgiveness. He wasn't able to reach it. He wrote a book on repentance that is still studied in the Jewish world today. His name was Yonah Jarandi, and the book was called Sha'arei Tshuva. Uh, which is the gates of repentance, because that's what hatred can lead to. And that's what the Rebbe was really trying to stop. And it was really in the fiber of his being. One of the revelations I had in coming to understand the Rebbe's love of fellow Jews, because I think a lot of people think it was strategic. 
you know, he had that love, but really what was driven was because he thought that that would be a more effective approach in getting people to become more observant. It wasn't. It so happens it was effective, but that wasn't the reason for the approach. The love was there. For example, when uh, Israel Mayor Lau, the former, the late chief rabbi of Israel, visited the Rebbe, he was a young man, and the Rebbe, but he was already a rav, he was already a rabbi, and the Rebbe asked him, what, what, what sort of work are you involved in as a rabbi? He said, I'm involved in Kiruv Rechokim. Kiruv Rechokim is a Hebrew term that means bringing near those who are far away, and it's a term used to bring people, to be, make them more observant. And the Rebbe just said to him, how do we know who's Karov? How do we know who's Rachav? They're all dear in God's eyes. How do we know who near? How do we know who's near? How do we know who's far away? They're all dear in God, dear in God's eyes. It was a whole different sort of approach. You know, it's a, people who think out of the box. They think in different ways. I remember I once read a story about Shmuel Salant, who was the leading posek in the Eidah Haredit in Jerusalem in the late 1800s. And a couple once came to him with a with a shayla, with a question. Their two sons had gone to America. These people were living in Jerusalem. They were poor. The sons were sending them back money from America, but reports came to them that the sons were no longer observant and were certainly not Shomer Shabbat. They didn't, which is easy to believe because in America, most Jews worked on Shabbos in those days. In fact, there were factories where they would say to a Jew the first week he worked there on Friday, if you don't come in tomorrow on Saturday, then don't come in on Monday. So it was a very hard thing. And their question was, could they use the money that they were being sent from their sons? Because the money was in part earned from Chilul Shabbat, desecration of Shabbat. Shmuel Salant had a fascinating answer. He said, the reports you've heard come from many people, or from several people, and they're probably true. But if the reports are true, it means that your sons have stopped observing the mitzvot. There is one mitzvah they are still trying to observe, honor your father and mother. You want to take that away from them too? So it's a whole different way of viewing. The Rebbe also thought in that broader perspective. George Rohr and George and his dad, his late dad, Sammy Rohr, are like Chabad's probably biggest financial supporters, or certainly among them, they've built camp, uh, 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 Chabad uh, college houses, you know, all over. And in, in Russia, they've played a very major role. George is an example of a very philanthropic Jew who's also a highly knowledgeable Jew. He's a member of KJ, Kilas Yeshurun, a modern Orthodox shul on the Upper East Side. And one year between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, he came and said to the Rebbe with great pride, he said, I started a beginner's minion because, as you know, a lot of people who are not knowledgeable, it's very hard for them if they walk into a shul, particularly an Orthodox shul on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and the prayers are all in Hebrew, and they need guidance. So he started a minion where they didn't do all the prayers, but he explained each prayer, and he said to the Rebbe with great pride, 180 Jews with no background came to my minion. And the Rebbe registered no expression on his face. If anything, he looked a little unhappy. And the Rebbe was quite old then, so George did what many people do with an old person. He repeated what he had said in a much louder voice. <laughs> I want the Rebbe to know that 180 Jews with no background came to our Rosh Hashanah service. And the Rebbe said, what do you mean they had no background? They're the descendants of Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valeah. They're the children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. He didn't want people who were observant to feel self-righteously superior to other Jews. That's what his love was like. I'll tell you another interesting feature I learned about the Rebbe's love. And this is a very unusual uh, trait for a leader. As big as Chabad ever became, and he was proud of that, and he was happy about it, he always remained, though, focused on the individual. I know it from my own experience, from a story that happened in my family, which probably has a lot to do with why I ended up writing the book, because it had a very big impact on me. My father, Shlomo Telushkin, Alava Shalom, was the Rebbe's accountant. He had been the accountant since the time the Friedeke Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, had come to America in 1940. And my grandfather had very close ties in Chabad, uh, very close, and in fact my grandfather is buried only four graves away from where the Rebbe is buried, but he was not only in Chabad, because Chabad for most of that time was anti-Zionist. 
one of the things Menachem Mendel Schneerson did was he ended that, that period. Chabad always had trouble because Zionism was a secular movement and they had trouble with accepting a secular government in Israel. Uh, so the Rebbe moved it. He never technically became a Zionist, but believe me, Chabad was very, very pro-Israel. But in any case, so my father was the Rebbe's account, and, and in June of 1986, I was living in Israel, and I get a phone call from my mom that my dad had had a bad stroke and was in a coma, and I, of course, immediately flew home. And every day we got two calls from the Rebbe's office. The Rebbe wants to know how your father is. And then my father came out of the coma. He was a little confused. Sometimes he was thinking very clearly. Other times he was confused. I always say my father was like a man who was running full speed and ran into a brick wall. Because in one day he could no longer be an accountant. My father used to give a weekly cheer in Talmud. He could no longer do it. But then one day, a few days after he comes out of the coma, I get a phone call from Rabbi Krinsky, who was the Rebbe's very close aide. We had a meeting, he said, of the Hanhala, of the leadership, and an accounting question came up, and the Rebbe said, ask Shlomo. So I said to him, Rabbi Krinsky, you know, my father's in ICU, he's still confused. He says, we know that, and the Rebbe knew it, but nonetheless, he had a question, you should bring your father. So, of course, I went and asked my father the question. My father looked at me, and he said, yeah, it's, they should do this and this. It was obvious to him. And I realized at that moment what had happened. The Rebbe's sitting there in his office in Brooklyn, dealing with a lot of big issues, but he's also worrying about my father, who he knows had to feel it's terrible. You have a stroke, suddenly your life in many ways comes to an end. But it wasn't just that. It's also the Rebbe's intelligence. He came up with a question that my father was able to answer. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to ask a question that would be so simple that it would be sound condescending. And he didn't want to ask a question that my father really wouldn't be able to answer which would make him feel even worse. And that was characteristic. I came across a story from Shmuel Kaplan. Shmuel Kaplan has been a shliach in Baltimore probably for 40 years. He was in a kolo as a young man. He had gotten married and he was a kolo. And the Rebbe, he, assi he was assigned a case of a teenage girl. She was like 17 who was going through a very severe rebellion. And the Rebbe said he should be made available to talk with her. And he did. And he was shocked. The girl really was, and a lot of people go through rebellions. Hers was a little more extreme. She would write the Rebbe, and, uh, and she would get answers from the Rebbe within a day. And then on one occasion, she wrote a Rebbe, the Rebbe a letter about how much pain she was in, and the Rebbe said, I feel your pain. Somehow this didn't satisfy the girl. She did think the Rebbe was being condescending. She said, how can you say you understand my pain? You don't know what I'm experiencing. Very upset. She sends the Rebbe in her letter. It's brought into the Rebbe. She gets an answer within two hours. And Kaplan told me this was the answer she got. When you will grow up, and when you will merit to grow up and marry, and God willing have a child, the nature of things are that in the first year, towards the end of the first year, a child begins to teethe. Teething is a painful process, and the child cries as a result. The mother feels that pain as if it were her own. Kachani margish tzarech. That's how I feel your pain. Kaplan said that was the first time the girl felt somebody was comprehending her. And when I saw him a couple of years ago at the annual kinos of, of the shluchim, at the annual gathering of the shluchim, I asked him, are you still in touch with her? He says, yeah, she's a grandmother now. You know, her life turned around from that point on because she felt somebody understood her and somebody knew what was going on. The Rebbe is often thought of as that he just created leaders, but the truth that he just created followers. But the truth is, what the Rebbe really want what was to create leaders. One of the first people I interviewed was Label Groner, Groner and Kuhn, uh, not Groner and Kuhn, was also obviously a very major figure there. But uh, in the secretariat of the Rebbe, so Groner and Krinsky were two really of, and Rabbi Klein were th three really major figures. Groner told me that when his wife gave birth to their first child, they had twins, and he had a halachic question. It, it's a halachic question. Does the mayel, does the man performing the circumcision, does he have to make a separate bracha bef between each one, or can he make one bracha for both? The generally accepted answer is, is that you have a separate bracha for each mm -hmm. child. But he went and asked the Rebbe uh, what he should do. He actually, it's funny, I've never told the story, I, I, I didn't tell the story exactly in that, what happened in my book, 
for reasons you might understand in a minute, the Rebbe first said to him, go ask Nissen to Lushkin. He said, go ask my grandfather. <laughs> my grandfather was not comfortable answering a question that had been posed to the Rebbe. He said, go, go back and ask the Rebbe again. <laughs> so he went back and asked the Rebbe again, and the Rebbe said to Groner, you have smicha like I do, you look it up and decide what you think is right. And he looked it up and decided, and then he came in and told the Rebbe what he decided, and the Rebbe said, that's what I would have decided too. In other words, he tried to empower people. I'll tell you a story. It's a great story I came across. One of the early Chabad, not very early, one of the Chabad Shluchim was a man named, and it's important to remember his name, Moshe Yitzchak Hecht. Hecht is a very significant family within Chabad, but remember the man's first name, Moshe Yitzchak Hecht. Hecht goes to New Haven, and he's not having a good time. He's having trouble getting, raising money, he's having trouble getting enough followers, he feels very frustrated. He writes a letter to the Rebbe, and he says, Rebbe, I need you to, to do it for me, and I need you to do it all. He gets back the following not very sympathetic letter from the Rebbe. The Rebbe says, I have already done as you have suggested. I sent to New Haven Rabbi Moshe Yitzchak Hecht. It is apparent that you don't know this man. You don't know the strengths that were given him. You should try and get to know him, and everything will change. The mood, the trust in God, the daily joy. This was characteristic. The book had already been sent in to my editor, and then I came across a story I couldn't resist putting it in, about Tzvi Hirsch Weinrib. Tzvi Hirsch Weinrib was a very major leader in the Orthodox world. He, for years, was the head of the OU, and he now serves as the editor-in-chief of the English translation of the Steinzeltz Talmud. When he was a young man, he was about 30, he had been a bit of a wunderkind. He had been, from a very young age, very bright, very accomplished. Anyway, he finds himself, he's living in Silver Springs, Maryland. He's finishing his PhD as a child psychologist. He's working as a psychologist in the school system. He also gives a shear several nights a week. And to boot, he's going through a period, he's having some doubts. Doubts both as to what he should do with his life professionally and some religious issues. He has a friend who's a Chabadnik. He says, why don't you call up and go see the Rebbe? Anyway, so he does call up Chabad, and he gets the phone. He understands later it was Rabbi Chodakov. And he starts expressing some of his questions, and he hears that Chodakov sometimes is turning to somebody else and asking, <laughs> And he understands it must be the Rebbe is in the room. And at a certain point, the question, the, he hears the voice from the back saying, who is it that you're speaking to? This was well before they had caller ID. So, so at that point, Weinberg wasn't sure yet whether he wanted to reveal his identity because he didn't know if he was going to come see the Rebbe. And, you know, he was saying some pretty personal things. So he answers, he said, a Jew from Maryland. They continue talking a bit longer, and the questions are now getting more and more detailed. And finally, he hears that voice in the background say, tell him, he doesn't have to come see me, tell him to consult. There's a rabbi in Maryland named Weinrib, he should speak to him. <laughs> so Chodakov says to him, did you hear what the Rebbe said? And Weinrib couldn't believe that the Rebbe had said that, so he said, tell me what he said. And he said, if the Rebbe says, you should go speak to this uh, rabbi in Maryland named Weinrib. So he says, I'm Weinrib. <laughs> so Chodakov is shocked <laughs> and repeats it to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, Azoy, if that's the case, tell him to consult with himself. <laughs> Weinrib says that that story changed his life. He said, I was the sort of person who was often insecure. And whenever a problem would come up, my instinct was always to immediately consult, ask somebody what I should do, ask somebody what they think I should do. He said, ever since that story happened, when an issue comes up in my life, the first thing I do is, he said, I go to a chair, I sort of lay back, I, he said, I'll read a bit of a sicha, I'll read a bit of a talk that the Rebbe had given, and then I'll really explore with myself what is it that I really want. And he said, more often than not, I am able to come up with the answer. If I can't, he's still going to consult with people. But he said he felt empowered by that. And that was really a remarkable feature because, you know, for all that people think, oh, these people are such devoted followers of the Rebbe, we know the Chabad Shluchim tend to be leaders. They are very devoted to the Rebbe, but they have very great leadership potential, and it didn't come about by accident. You know, there are a number of figures whose lives were very deeply impacted by the Rebbe, 
who were not part of Chabad. Jonathan Sachs claims that it was because of an encounter he had with the Rebbe when he was 21 that he became a rabbi. Because Sachs at the time was at Cambridge, and he was considering going into law or economics or philosophy. And the Rebbe very much encouraged him, and Sachs said that that's really was the, that really was what, ch uh, what changed him at that time. But Sachs recalls something else that happened at that first encounter. At a certain point, he said to the Rebbe, I recently found myself in a situation, and the Rebbe said, don't use that expression. He says, it's a passive expression. If you didn't find yourself in a situation, you placed yourself in a situation. Because if you place yourself in one situation, then you can place yourself in another situation. If people just perceive themselves as victims of circumstance, they are unlikely to take control over their own lives. And so Sachs says he doesn't use that expression anymore. It really had that tremendous effect on him, and it, and it changed him. So the Rebbe was very into the importance of accepting responsibility. By the way, you know, it's funny. I remember a story that Moshe Feller told me. He was a Chabad Shliach in Minneapolis. And uh, he asked the Rebbe, uh, before he went on Shlichus, he says, give me specific instructions what I should do. The Rebbe says, no, I can only give you general instructions. You're the one on the ground. You have to know what you're going to do. And then Feller told me really a funny story. Feller had not grown up as a Chabadnik. And uh, he had been an avid baseball fan. And he was in Minneapolis when the Dodgers came there to play in a World Series. The World Series that became very famous because in the opening game, Sandy Koufax wouldn't pitch on Yom Kippur. Isn't that funny? Koufax was, might have been the greatest pitcher in history, but the game he's most famous for is the game he didn't pitch. <laughs> so, uh, so Feller went to the hotel and got in looking as, you know, he told them, I'm Sandy, Co he must have said I'm Sandy Koufax's rabbi. I don't know, somehow he was got up and he really brought Koufax uh, the tefillin, which Koufax accepted, he didn't want to put it on then. But Feller knew something that I don't know if the Rebbe would have known. Koufax, of course, was a left-handed pitcher, you know, and people who are left-handed get slightly different tefillin than people who are right-handed. So that's what, you know, the Rebbe had said to him, you know the facts on the ground, now say so you can do it. Another feature of the Rebbe, how many of you were at my talk last night? Okay, very few. For those who were at my talk, you'll get a refresher for the next five minutes. <laughs> the Rebbe was into the very careful choosing of words. This is, you know, it's funny. He anticipated in some ways uh, the whole field that's emerged of positive psychology, the work done by people like Martin Seligman, which is fantastically <laughs> important, how important positive language is. You know, we know it. Children who were raised by parents who used a lot of negative language often incorporated it. If you were, in some ways, I mean, without even necessarily getting into the words of emotionally abused, there are people who are very critical, and it can be devastating, just as people who are very positive can be very empowering. So the Rebbe, for example, how many of you know, call out uh, the right, uh, the answer if you know it. How do you say hospital in Hebrew? Yes. The Rebbe did not like the word Beit 